I'm here with Ning CEO Gina Bianchini. Hello, Gina. Hi, how are you? Good. Thanks for joining me uh, here at the World Economic Forum in Davos to sit down and talk about Ning for a little bit. Thanks for having me. How do you like the hotel? I describe it as Swedish dorm room chic, mm -hmm. and it's pretty great, actually. Yeah, even though there's no internet access and all the internet... It's a little ironic. Here. Yeah. It's a little ironic. So everyone's down here in the lobby working. I almost feel like that's actually on purpose in some way. It's good for me, because if I want to talk to you, I just go to the lobby and there you are <laughs> right, on the computer. Right. You can't really hide when you only have internet access in one place. Absolutely. So. Is this your first World Economic Forum? It is. And what do you think of the conference itself? It's pretty amazing. Um, it's a little overwhelming, actually, because there are so many different people from so many different walks of life doing so many interesting things that it's you know all packed within a small Swiss tea, you know, ski town yeah. um, that it's kind of hard to sort of get your bearings, but it's been wonderful. I really enjoyed our panel the first day. Yeah, you were on a panel with Evan Williams, uh, Randy Zuckerberg, Owen Van Atta, Reed Hoffman was there. I was there reporting on it. You guys talked about social networks. Um, did you feel like there's a, a good amount of attention, of attention here to technology? It seems like there is. There absolutely is. I mean, I have... You know, it's rare that you go to conferences that have sort of a broad, you know, policy and you know, political base as well as um, you know, being something that's just technology focused. And I've had more people come up to me trying to explore how to use social technologies to change the world. And I think that that is, you know, always a great conversation to have. Are you, do you find that most people here are very familiar with Ning? New for some people? Is Ning sort of part of the established set of technology companies that people here know about? Um, I don't think so. Really? I, I, yeah, I mean, I think that the thing that has actually been really surprising to me is that how many people actually touch a Ning network from all walks of life. So I had uh, someone from a, from a pretty large advertising agency come up to me and said that, say that their, their team in Brazil has been using Ning for, for oh, basically three years, or almost right. three years when we really first launched Ning. The network. advertising agency has a Ning presence. Yeah, well, and, and even better, they're using it for their internal team to coordinate. So, you know, I think the thing that's been the most fun from my perspective is the fact that um, we made the decision early on that we would share branding, that we weren't going to yeah. be a service that basically was one size fits all, but that for what we do, being a social platform for interests and passions and really being about unique social experiences, that we needed to share the brand. And we needed to basically allow our network creators to put their brand first with Ning being a bit recessive. So we don't have the same um, visibility that a Facebook or a Twitter or a LinkedIn has, but we actually think that for what we do, it's absolutely critical that we give and we share brand identity because what people are doing on Ning is creating unique contextual social experiences for the things that really matter to them. And so that's actually something that's been fun for me is to see all the different ways that people are using Ning today and in some cases you know, they absolutely know it's Ning, and in other cases, yeah. they don't know it's Ning. But well, that's not white mapping. label. You allow yeah. domain mapping, which is some very basic Ning. Is there some footer or something? Any Ning? Yes. Branding at all in that yeah. case? Yeah, and absolutely. Then, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit with your sure. numbers. Um, you've you've raised a lot of money. You've raised $119 million now, and your last valuation was $750 million. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And you count among your investors, uh, Reed Hoffman, who's the founder of LinkedIn, and Mark Andreessen's actually a co-founder, but he's also on the board of Facebook. Um, is it awkward at all with Mark on the board of Facebook and Reed sort of being LinkedIn heavy? Is that at all awkward? And not at all. Not at and, all. and I think there's a because very... they are both competitors, right? No, and that's actually no. why it's okay. okay. So, and I think that this is the thing that has been really emerging in the last year, is the fact that different people, or I should say actually the same people, are using different social technologies for different purposes. And on some level, what I think that the, the, the true story of the last few years has been that everybody's sort of been trying to figure out where they fit into the world. And whether or not, you know, different people are competing directly with, by the way, that's fun. That's <laughs> part of the charm of the Exactly, time. exactly. Yeah. I was like, what is that? Um, but it is, it, I think it's a really interesting 
evolution that I did not expect when, and I don't think any of us expected when we started, because there's always the sense of like it is a it's a horse race. It's it's a zero sum game. Well, the reality is it's not a zero sum game as it relates to social technologies. And in fact, what's happening is that the same people are basically using. You know, LinkedIn for their professional identity. They're using Facebook for connecting to the people that they know in the real world and have gone to school with that are you know, friends from the neighborhood. And what Twitter is about is news and real-time events in a way that is different from Facebook. And what we do is basically enable people to dive deeper and create rich social experiences for the topics and the things that they truly care about. And if you look at it, and, and the, the aha moment that I had was that that's actually what makes us human beings and what makes us people. And these different social technologies actually all work together really well. So, for example, two weeks ago we launched Twitter integration. And we've seen a huge increase in terms of people sharing content from their name networks. That's both signing in and publishing back to Twitter? Um, it's just publishing to Twitter okay. and then people coming back with a right. shortened URL. Yep. And so what's been great about that is that people love to be able to share on Twitter. They love to be able then to send people and come back into a Ning network and we're seeing that in the numbers. And I think, you know, we'll shortly launch a similar integration, you know, using using Facebook. Um, because it just makes sense and it's what people want. They want to be able to have a very fluid relationship between LinkedIn, Twitter, Ning and then the networks that they belong to and Facebook and I think that's actually something that um, at least from the inside we all realize and it's why for example you know Reed Hoffman has been a great supporter of Ning why you know Mark can sit on the board of Facebook and Ning and why you know Mark is an investor in you know so many of the different social technologies that exist and I think it's actually something that that um, is really fun about right now. When you integrate with Facebook, will, will that be a Facebook connect integration in the sense of sign in to your Ning account, create a Ning account through Facebook, and publish back to Facebook, or more like what you're doing with Twitter, and it's just a publishing back to Facebook? More like what we're doing with Twitter for V1. And, and there's no political strategy that says, you know, we shouldn't have Facebook Connect or we should have Facebook Connect. It's just simply a matter of we're seeing what's working and iterating really rapidly from here. How about just from a user perspective, importing the the, uh, the social graph and having your friends list in one place? Is that something where you think there might be demand at names? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's something that we'll, we'll explore in the next few months as we move forward. One place I think you, I personally think you do compete with Facebook is on Facebook pages. And so companies or people will set up a profile on Facebook to get fans in. It's not just their friends, they said they, they promote it, they put it on their advertisement. They also might do that with Ning, whether it's just on the Ning network or they actually domain mount and make it look all their own. It seems like they, they might do both, but it seems like there's a clear direct competition between Ning networks and Facebook pages. Agree, disagree, how do you see that? Absolutely disagree. And in fact, actually what's happening, and it, I mean, I totally love the fact that that the, the you know there want there there should be this perceived horse race of one person wins and another person loses, and that's just not how it's working today. And what's really cool is the fact you that you see people doing both. Yeah, absolutely. That's why you don't think there's competition. Right. It's it's problems. why we can actually integrate with Twitter and use Twitter as a distribution. And and what I actually think a distribution channel, and it basically very fluidly send people to Ning and then people are publishing from Ning into Twitter really effectively. And so what I think actually is happening, and, and we're seeing this especially amongst you know people who are artists and people who you know started in 2005, 2006 with a MySpace page, which is that they basically look at it and they say, okay, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, phenomenal for distribution. That is the place where I can put up a fan page, and within a few, you know, a few hours, I can have a million followers. The same thing is true for Twitter. So if you look at the people that basically have over a million followers, um, they are getting increasingly sophisticated in terms of really understanding that those are phenomenal but very lightweight distribution channels. Yeah, and it's great. What they are realizing, and where I think that the market is going is in the sophistication around where are you sending people? 
and that where you're sending people and where the destination is, whether that was originally a blog or whether that was originally a website, okay. is actually becoming a rich, immersive social experience. And now you're talking about names. And now I'm talking yeah. about names. And a so, Facebook page isn't as rich and yeah, immersive which, a social experience. That's right. not what they're trying to do. And so what okay. they're, they're trying to do is basically give people a way within Facebook to say, I'm a fan of, you know, Pete Wentz and Fall Out Boy. Or I, you know, love Adidas. And I think yeah. that that's fantastic, but it's very lightweight. And it's good that it's lightweight because it basically means that people have a way to thread all of these different ways that they want to interact with brands, with celebrities, with artists, with the things that they truly care about. Um, but I think that where the market is going and where you'll see more and more people do interesting things is on it's sort of where is the hub? Where are they sending people on? And, and, and that is the name. So, for example, um, Soleil Moonfry um, has, I think, 1.4 million Twitter followers and just launched a Ning network uh, two days ago. Okay. And her excitement about it uh, is really around the fact that she can allow and enable the people who are following her on Twitter, uh, primarily moms and, and young moms who have the same you know messy, wonderful life as a mother that she does, that she gives them an opportunity to really dive deeper into what she cares about and what she's passionate about and really building that out as you know a, a small but very powerful lifestyle brand for, for moms. Do you, have, you said you have, how many internal uniques are you tracking? On, sure. on a global basis, by yeah. IP address, so that excludes bots, we have 92 million um, monthly uniques. And that's yeah. four months ago, we had 70 million global Does monthly that include the, uh, the networks that are domain mapped? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. So that's um, a fourth of Facebook, something like that. But you don't have the, the sort of press footprint that Facebook has, or even Twitter, which is smaller than you. Why is that? Very simple reason. One size fits all social platforms are easier to get your head around because they're simpler, more straightforward, and they have sort of the overarching brand identity. When you're on Facebook, you're on Facebook. Yeah. And it is blue and white. And when you're on Twitter, you are on Twitter. Yeah. In our case, we're, we took a different approach, and we have a different strategy, which is we think that the true opportunity for us is to enable unique, <coughs> immersive, very rich social experiences around the things people care about, and really allow them to dive deeper, as I mentioned earlier, as that hub. So the things people care about get the press attention as opposed Absolutely. to being Absolutely. Absolutely. So for example, Lincoln Park just launched their official website is now a social experience on them. And that was three or four days ago. Because they realize that what their fans want is this opportunity to say, I love you on MySpace, I love you on Twitter, I want to know what's going on and what I should be paying attention to, but then I want a way to dive deeper into you know, so the Lincoln Park experience. Are you, I, this isn't on camera, of course, but you can see what I'm going. So the way you're saying it, Ning is sort of the center, and you've got Facebook and Twitter and MySpace and yeah. sort of focusing yeah. on that. Okay, so that's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. Um, do you uh, do you think Facebook, Twitter, and MySpace think about it that way, or do you think they see you as a competitor? Well, I don't think they see us as a competitor. Okay, who is a competitor? Well, this We're allowed is a, to, somebody's got to be out well, there. Well, but here's what's actually interesting yeah. in terms of what's happening in the market, and, and I think it's, I think it's, um, it, 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 this is not rainbows and sunshine in saying this, is what happened basically over the course, and if, if you notice, what's really interesting is the fact that all of these companies were basically founded in 2005, 2006, 2007. And what's actually happened is that each one of them has sort of gotten really comfortable and focused and actually are getting more and more narrowly focused on the thing that they do better than anybody else. So Facebook, with Facebook Lite, is actually going more in the direction of you know, connecting you with the people that you have strong relationships yeah. with, with your real identity, with status messages, and with photo sharing. And they do that better than anybody else. Twitter, you know, and they had that year where they were like, is Twitter a competitor or are they not? As you can sort of see in the last six months, everybody's decided that, you know, while there's some overlap, they're not, it's not a horse race. They're not actually competing head to head where Facebook wins and Twitter loses. Yeah. So Twitter's about news and real time events. And you've seen the same thing with LinkedIn where, you know, I think they've gotten really strong and have tremendous momentum by basically saying we own professional identity. Professional identity has different characteristics than 
what you want to do with your friends on Facebook, and that's actually great. So actually, if you look across the market, and then for us, interests and passions. If you look across the market, the thing that's interesting is that none of these companies actually have a number two. So there's no actual, and what gets confusing yeah. about it is Facebook doesn't have a number two. Twitter doesn't have a number two. LinkedIn, I mean, you, were, you lived through that. They yeah. had, you know, the different competitors. All of those competitors are gone, and they are clearly the dominant player. And in our case, you know, we don't really have anybody else who's creating unique social experiences as an online platform, and specifically an online social platform. So what's confusing to, to you know, uh, to an observer of the market that wants to see, you know, where the head-to-head -head horse race, zero-sum game, you know, Microsoft, Netscape, situation, it's not actually happening, it's really actually a race for each one of these companies and each one of these services to get as much traction and deliver as much value to an individual for the thing that they do better than anybody else. Okay. Are you happy with your revenue model, how that's going? Absolutely. So how happy, like we 9 out of 10? <laughs> you talk I, about I'm, revenue? You talk about revenue. We don't talk about yeah. revenue. We'll talk, I'm happy to talk about the revenue streams that we have. It's ads, it's upsells, right? It's ad, it's upsells, and then premium features. Basically, what are the features, like virtual gifts, which we launched in October, um, that allow our network creators to make money from their networks. So when a member of the Lost Zombies Ming network, which is... Um, you know, 10,000 people who dress up as zombies and take pictures and videos and, and connect with each other and building this collaborative documentary. When they're giving... What is that? Is it lostzombies.name.com? It's, it's lostzombies.com. Check it out. It's awesome. And what they're doing, you know, with their virtual gifts is their members are actually giving each other, like, bloody chainsaws. Right. And when that, actually, when that transaction happens, we split the revenue 50-50 with our network creators. Yeah. We think that there are tremendous opportunities there, whether it's around... How many bloody chainsaws have been given? <laughs> I don't actually know Hundreds, specifically yeah. how many bloody chainsaws have been given. Are you a member of the group? I, I'm a member of Lost Zombies, I am. You? Actually, you know what, that's... I don't know if I'm... You should be like Tom. You should, like, from MySpace, you should be a member, be a of, member of every yeah. network. I actually yeah. think that's a good idea. I like that. With a really ridiculous pose <laughs> and some pictures. <laughs> so what is revenue? Are you profitable yet? Are you approaching profitability? Are you, like, at the point where you could be profitable if you wanted to slow down and grow? Okay. <laughs> um, we're really happy, and so are our investors. It's the benefit of being a, a private company, but it doesn't make your job any easier. How many employees do you have? We have 166 employees. 166? Yeah. And you said you're not you're not going to talk about profitability, not or revenue, about or revenue, profitability. Facebook does. I know. They're private. Twitter doesn't. MySpace doesn't. Hint. A million a month. Ten million a month. We're really happy with we're really, where, really happy. Where, where, where where we're at and where we're going. Do you think when you approach profitability, will you announce that? Stay tuned. Okay, so that's that's at least something I can drop that down. Um, okay, I think that's it. Got uh, how many registered users? Did you talk about we have 41 that? million registered users, and we're adding about uh, a million new registered users every 12 to 13 days. And you're not spending anything on marketing, or you are? Nothing. I've never seen any advertisement anywhere. No, it's it's, viral. it's primarily email. As we launch Twitter and soon yeah. we'll launch Facebook, those are actually becoming great great sources of new members coming into and across the Ning networks. And so, yeah, I mean, it, you know, the good, the good news, bad news of our model is that it's incredibly um, productive and effective in terms of growth and exponential growth. But, you know, certainly we've made a different decision than, than other services in terms of really sharing that, that brand placement and then really allowing people to create incredibly unique, rich social experiences on Ning. Who goes public first? Zynga, Facebook, LinkedIn? I, I am not um, great at, at predicting timing, um, but I think all of them are incredibly good businesses that are real. And, you know, yeah. the reality is two years ago, three years ago, it, well, Zynga wasn't in existence, but everybody was sort of wondering, well, how are, how are social technologies going to make money? I think the yeah. story of 2009 was that one size Bloody fits all is the way going to make money. social platforms yeah. went mainstream. And I think the story of 2010, 2011, 2012 is social platforms become real businesses. 
you going to be going public, you think? Is that your aim? <laughs> Why is that your aim? Or have Andreessen get Facebook to buy you since we, you're competitor? Yeah, we, uh, we are very confident that we can be, you know, a large independent company. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank I really you so appreciate much. it.